Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Okay, let's begin with a, with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the blessings that you give us. Thank you for loving us and caring for us, calling us to be your children, providing for us. Lord, we ask that you continue to uh, care for our community as, as recovery continues from the storm. You know all about that. Just uh, allow uh, the various folks that are in town from out of town to help, that they actually help and are not a hindrance, and that things continue to get accomplished. It's amazing what has been done so far, and uh, that you would give us an opportunity to uh, share the gospel because of this storm. Thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Bible fast forward. If you need the download, you can get it. You know where to get it. We are in session 6B, the new covenant and the return of Judah. And uh, it's a continuation of what we saw last week. Exactly where we dropped off last week is where we're starting this week. I didn't go back and, and rehash any because it was paused at a pretty good place. Any questions or comments before we begin that? Okay, here we go. This brings us quickly now to Ezekiel. He's the third great prophet of the deportation or this period of time. He was an, also an early deportee, a contemporary of Jeremiah's. He predicted judgment, he predicted the destruction of Jerusalem, but he predicted ultimate restoration and consolation. And in Ezekiel 36, we get more detail of the new covenant that promises something in addition that was hinted in Jeremiah is more explicit here. It promises national renewal, hinted when Jeremiah talks about the covenant between Judah and Israel. Here the renewal is explicitly stated. And not only that, the new heart is emphasized again, and a new detail that what God is going to do in this new covenant is give His own Spirit to be inside of them, to companion with this new heart, and this, 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 uh, where the law is written on their hearts, this new relationship with God that is promised in the new covenant. So I pick up then the text from Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 24. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my own spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. Notice the echo of the Abrahamic there being reaffirmed. So you will be my people. I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it. I will not bring famine on you, says the Lord. On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places to be rebuilt. This is a wonderful, encouraging message to the people who are under the hand of God's judgment. Notice the details. A promise of national renewal, of rest restoration to the land, verse 24. Cleansing and forgiveness, verse 25, 29, and 33. A new heart and spirit, verse 26 and God placing His own Spirit within them, verse 27. If you jump over, and we're not going to do this in detail right now, to Ezekiel 37, there's a passage there, the famous dry, dry bones prophecy, where you have this picture of Israel and Judah being raised up again, the skeletons, and then flesh is put on them, and the Spirit is put in them. 
And so this is a reaffirmation of the element of spiritual and physical restoration of Israel. Some other things that you see as you go through the prophets, other hints that are dropped in Joel chapter 2, we realize that the promise of the Spirit given through Ezekiel here is not going to be reserved just for Jews. This is very important. Joel says in verse 28 of chapter 2, it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. You might make a mental note that in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit is given in virtue of the new covenant, now we haven't gotten to details now of what happens in the future, but we know that Jesus at the Last Supper says this is the blood of the new covenant, right? And then he tells them to wait until the gift of the Father is given, and after He ascends, they are in the upper room on Pentecost Sunday, and the gift of the Father is the Holy Spirit given then, and they pour out of the upper room, and they are prophesying, and they're speaking in tongues, and there's a roar and a wind, and people are wondering what's going on. Some think they're drunk, and Peter says, no, this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. And so all of this is tied together. Putting it all together, a kind of as, as one whole, taking these passages, the new covenant provides first for physical restoration and reunification for Israel and Judah. It also provides for a spiritual restoration of Israel based on a gift that would be extended to all people. Now, I want you to see how this covenant is being laid out. This is a covenant given to Israel. It is a covenant pro promising their reuniting and their spiritual rebirth. The spiritual rebirth will come as the Holy Spirit is given to the individuals in the nation, not just on top of the kings and anointing and the prophets, but given to every individual living with, within them. And it turns out that this gift of the Holy Spirit these provisions of the new covenant that entail forgiveness and cleansing and a new heart and a new relationship with God are not going to be just for Israel. Those provisions are things that are going to be shared with others. Note, extending the spiritual provisions of the new covenant to the Gentiles does not nullify previous promises that God made to national Israel. So the new covenant is given to Jews first, and there is a way, and we'll get more detail later, that the Gentiles get to participate in it. Now, this is a pretty cool promise because this pertains to forgiveness of sins and the giving of the Spirit and restoration of relationship. And I don't know about you, but now I'm thinking back here from the Abrahamic covenant. And I'm looking down through time and I'm seeing something happen. Because God said, in you what? All the nations of the world would be blessed. And we don't have much detail, but now there's more promise of things for the Jews that is going to include the nations of the world. And it's pretty good stuff. And so it just might be that we're seeing the unfolding plan of God as He's beginning to express more detail of what the blessing to the Gentiles, all the nations of the earth, the goyim, will actually look like. So taken as a whole, the spiritual provisions of the new covenant turns out to be the blessing of Abraham promised to the nations in the Abrahamic covenant. Um, this is often referred to in the New Testament simply as the promise of Abraham or the promise of the Spirit. And here's some examples, Galatians 3.14. In order that in Christ, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Notice how he connects the two, the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant. 
Ephesians 3, 6, to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. Now, of course, these are promises that have to be received by faith. Romans 4, verse 16, for this reason it's by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace, not law, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only those who are of the law, that would be the physical seed, right? But also to all of those who are of the faith of Abraham, that would be the spiritual seed, because he is the father of us all. So now these things are beginning to come together. Now what I'd like to do is I want to take a few moments and I want to go back to something I said in the very, very first session. I want to talk about a passage that came up that was really the thing that incited the discussion that I was having with the students in Cairo, Egypt, and this is in the book of Jeremiah in chapter 29 and verse 11. And my comments at the very first session was that there is a habit of grabbing these verses out of their context and then making them mean for us as Christians something that they were not intended to mean when they were originally written, but I understand why that happens because many Christians don't have an understanding of the big picture and the flow of the storyline and how God is working through these prophets as covenant enforcers in light of the covenants that have already come down. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to go back to Jeremiah chapter 29, and you may want to turn there. And I, I want to show you how a previously abused passage actually looks once we understand the larger story, the storyline, and what it means in light of the larger context. Now, the verse itself goes like this, and many of you know this uh, because you've seen it so many places. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. It's a passage isolated and passed on to other Christians to encourage them. That here is a promise that God has a future and a hope for you. Now, it, I hope it's clear that I'm suggesting that this is not an appropriate use of this passage, but I think I won't have to argue very aggressively for it when you see its place as part of the larger picture. Um, by the way, this verse seems to show up everywhere. Bookmarks, bumper stickers, posters, pillows. Uh, cited as God's personal promise to Christians. But when we see the big picture, I think we're going to understand otherwise. So let me ask you a few questions here. We're going to step back again. What covenants at this point of the history of Israel, at the time when Jeremiah is speaking, so he is promising a new covenant in the future, it's not present, right? So what covenants are governing God's interactions with his people at the time of this prophecy? Well, there's just two the Abrahamic covenant, right, and the Mosaic covenant. Uh, the Abrahamic gives long-term protection. The Mosaic covenant gives short-term cursing under, as a result of the disobedience, all right? So what is happening to the nation of Israel at this point in, this, in, this, uh, in their history? Is this blessing or cursing? cursing? Cursing, bad news. Why are they being judged? They're being judged because of their disobedience to the Mosaic covenant. Do they have reason to hope in the long term? Now think before you answer this question. Even though they are under the mighty hand of God in judgment, do they have reason to hope in the long term? Yes, the correct answer is yes, they do. Because God has already made a promise that is staying with them all the way. God's promise to Abraham. Now at this point, there are two important interpretive questions necessary to ask to unlock and unpack the meaning of Jeremiah 20, 29, 11. First question, to whom is Jeremiah speaking? Second question, what are the plans for welfare and not calamity that he refers to that will give Jeremiah's audience a future and a hope? Those are really key. So let's go back to the context, and now I'm going to read quite a bit. And I hope in light of what we've spoken of so far, some of this is going, the change is going to fall into the meter for you, all right? Jeremiah 29, verse 1 and following. 
Now, these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. All right? So we've got the setting now. What we're going to see is the contents of a personal letter from one group of people, from one person to another. The person sending the letter is Jeremiah. He's taking dictation, as it were, from God. And there's a group of people, the elders that are in Babylon, that are receiving this letter. So we're reading someone else's mail. Is this clear? Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Same people. Build houses. Live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce, take wives, become the fathers of sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decease, uh, rather decrease. In other words, unpack. You're going to be there a while. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray for the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will have welfare. A lot could be said about these verses. If I was given a long sermon, I'd pause for a while. I just want you to see what's building up here, where he's going. For, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you. A lot of false prophets going around during this time. And do not listen to the dreams which they dream, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. Now, these are prophets that first said, Nebuchadnezzar's not going to win. He's not going to destroy the temple. He's not going to destroy the city. Don't worry. God will rescue us. False prophets, they were wrong. Now they're carried off into Babylon. And the same false prophets are saying, we're not going to stay here very long. God's going to rescue us. He's going to send us back. God says through Jeremiah, not so, unpack. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed. That's how long you're going to be there. When 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you. What good word is that? It's the same promise he's been trading on for 1,500 years. to bring you back to this place, subtext, which I promised to Abraham. For, and here comes our verse, for I know the plans that I have for you, exiles in Babylon, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope, and then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, which is exactly what Daniel was doing 70 years later. And I will be found by you, and I will restore your fortunes, and I will gather you from all the nations. They are in one nation now. He is referring to the whole kit and caboodle, And from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Now, having read the whole thing, let's ask our questions again. To whom is Jeremiah speaking with this whole thing? Well, he's speaking to the nation of Judah specifically here in exile. I should change my notes there. It is Judah in exile in Babylon to whom he is speaking, but he is speaking about the whole of them. Our second question, what are the specific plans that God has, quote, for welfare and not for calamity to give them a future and a hope, close quote? Well, it's to restore the fortunes and to gather them back to the land of promise. But there's more in this chapter. Sometimes we stop right there, but there is more. Now, I'm not going to read through all of the chapter, <clears throat> but there is a chapter or a promise of restoration for some of God's people. Seventy years later, when repentance happens, it's also a promise of destruction for God's people. At that moment, who have resisted Jeremiah, who prophesied falsely, and who believed the false prophets and refused to cooperate. So I read on here. 
Jeremiah 29, 17, and 18. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Now, by the way, this is the same chapter. He's just continuing, that's all. Behold, I am sending upon them those false prophets among his own people. Sword, famine, pestilence. I will make them like split open figs that cannot be eaten due to rottenness. I will pursue them with the sword, with famine, with pestilence. I will make them a terror to all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse and a horror and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. Why don't we stitch that on a pillow? <laughs> Put it on a poster. Nobody wants to claim that promise. You know why? Because that's not their promise. And they know it. This is a promise for other guys doing bad things. That isn't their promise. And neither is the other one. You see, there are two plans in this chapter, not one. One plan for eventual, eventual welfare and not calamity for one group of God's people at that time, and a second plan for immediate calamity and not welfare, just the opposite. For another group of people at that time that are God's people. So which of these two plans in Jeremiah 29 can we claim for our own personal promise? <laughs> neither of them, because neither of these promises are for us. They are both for Israel. And I hope what you're seeing here, too, is that both of these are completely consistent with the covenants that God has made with Israel. Blessings and cursings under the Mosaic law, ultimate restoration to the land in light of God's enduring purpose with the Abrahamic contract. In other words, short-term plans for discipline, long-term plans for prosperity, Neither plan has anything directly to do with New Testament Christians. The author intends something entirely different. By the way, can I just ask you a simple question? Do you see this? Is this not completely obvious now that you know the storyline, now that you know the big picture? Do you see that there's absolutely nothing new in this passage? It's just a reiteration of the old stuff. Given at an important, important time in their history, by the way, do you see that God is simply reaffirming His faithfulness to His chosen people during a time of extreme discipline? And can you see, I hope, how reckless it is if we use the, this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, for any other purpose. So I want to give you a strong exhortation here as your teacher, don't do that. Anyone who uses this promise in any other way is misusing the Word of God. It's just that simple. Now, it doesn't mean you got to beat up on, a, on somebody else every time you see it in a bookmark or on a pillow or on a poster because it's going to take a long time to explain all that to them, and they probably aren't going to get it. And uh, a lot of people are very attached to this verse, so they might give you a fight. But I want you to know, since we have the time to go through it, and this isn't just about Jeremiah 29, 11, This is about the whole Bible, about reading it in light of its storyline, its line of argument. Well, God began to make good on that promise to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29. Seventy years later, we start the return to the land, which is the 11th major historical event of the nation of Israel. The first wave uh, took, uh, took place, uh, you find this in the book of Ezra, and Cyrus, king of Persia, <clears throat> is uh, the one who put forth the edict in 538 B.C. Uh, they begin rebuilding the temple. Uh, actually bringing joy and mixed sorrow because the people who were, who were involved in this initial return to rebuild a, a much smaller temple, a much more modest temple, remembered the glories of Solomon in that temple that had been destroyed. Of course, it was hundreds of years after Solomon, but it was still a glorious temple, obviously, destroyed by, by um, Nebuchadnezzar. And they wept. The temple is completed 70 years after the deportation to the day, or to the, I should say, to the year. A second wave you also find in the book of Ezra around 458 B.C. Um, you know, it's like 70 years later during the reign of Artaxerxes. Uh, 
Ezra returns with 1,500 people, including a small group of Levites to serve in the temple. Uh, he, he, he institutes badly needed social reforms, religious reforms. He's very zealous for the law. The third wave you find in the book of Nehemiah, 444 B.C. Uh, Nehemiah is a cupbearer to Artaxerxes and a very high-ranking official in the Medo-Persian court. He gets permission from the king to go back, and he rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days, Nehemiah 6.15. So we've covered some important material here in this, our sixth session. Uh, we continue to see the interplay, the dynamic interplay, the back and forth of the promises that God made both to Abraham and through Moses with regards to the Mosaic Covenant. Um, in spite of God's severe discipline of His people, um, the northern kingdom dispersed, the southern and Babylonian captivity, um, God still offers grace by sending Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah as great prophetic lights during this time to encourage His people to let them know that He has not forgotten His promise, that God is God over all history. And in the midst of this terrible situation, a brand new covenant is promised that will not be like the old covenant which they broke. It's going to be one they can't break. It's going to provide for national restoration, for spiritual revival for Israel, and it will be the blessing of Abraham to all the nations because of the complete personal forgiveness, the giving of the Holy Spirit, and the personal relationship with God that will grow out of, develop out of the provisions of the new covenant. This brings us to the end of the Old Testament period, and the last words of the Old Testament come from the, pal the prophet Malachi, who closes his book with these words, Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And 400 years of prophetic silence follow that statement until the stillness is broken by the voice of one crying in the wilderness, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we will pick up the story at that point next time. Questions, comments? I see Elaine online and uh, Sybil online. I don't know who else is there. If you have a question online, just uh, put it in the comments there and we'll get to it. No questions? I have a uh, little mud love bracelet of Jeremiah 29 11. I love the verse. And. Uh, I've, I've gotten in trouble with other people before because I, I've said, well, you know, that's not really a promise to us. And uh, we have to be careful about how we, how we treat the Old Testament. There's a lot of good stuff there for us, stuff that applies to us. But uh, Shane and I were talking about this just before the service. The job of a, of a modern-day Bible teacher is to take the principles that are everlasting in one, in one, in one societal system. Uh, he, he said at the end, you know, read the Bible in its storyline. Take, it take the principle from the storyline and put it into our context. And so he, he spent a lot of time on Jeremiah 29, 11 in context. How does that verse apply to, how, how can we apply that verse to our lives today? Because clearly it's not written to us. But there also has to be a reason that God included it in the scripture that he wants us to know. So how can we apply it to us?
person that has ever been born, so that there's that. Okay. And um, if you're a believer, he's going to prosper us and not harm us. It may not be here on earth, but eternally we will we will be secure and prosper. So we can take those we can bank on those promises mm -hmm. even though we're not Israel. Right. And just two chapters later, we get to Jeremiah 31, which is the, the prophecy of the new covenant. And he spent a lot of time telling us how, yes, we're not Israel and Judah, but look at all these other passages that do apply Jeremiah 31 to us. And so there is a sense that the principle of Jeremiah 29, 11, that God knows and has planned for us good things. And you have to interpret what good things are. Um, you can't use this to say God has, has uh, planned for us to be wealthy. Because that may not be true. God didn't necessarily plan for us to be healthy. Um, because many of us are, are sick. There's a, God uses those things or creates those things for reasons. And so the, the principle of God has plans for us that he cares for us, that he protects us, and that he, he deals properly with us, still applies to us today. Can I claim 2911? No. But I can claim the principle from it because that principle is still true. And we can do that with just about every Old Testament passage. Some promises and some curses are specific to only Israel and have no application to us, but those are very few. Right, right. It was right. It, it was true as it was given in the immediate, but then there was again punishment coming to Israel. And, you know, as he said, 400 years later, Israel ceases to exist. And not until 1948 did they exist again. And who knows if this is even the Israel that will be there in the end times. I think it is, but I have no way to know that. Israel may go away again. You know, the, the Arabs may completely destroy Israel again and, and at some future date it come back. I don't know. Other questions or comments? As we get into uh, next week, Lord willing, it is... Uh, Another good chapter or section, session I guess is a better word, where we're going to be moving now into the New Testament. We, we go through the, the, the 400 years, this, what are often called the prophetic silent years, the dark years, um, the intertestamental period, which to me, the intertestamental period historically is a fascinating period of time. We don't have writing prophets at the time but there's an awful lot that goes on in Israel that sets up the world not just in Israel the, the world that goes on in, in in the world that sets up the world for the coming of the Messiah to me to me the intertestamental period is one of the most fantastic periods of time to see God's sovereignty at work just think about what he does in order for in order to prepare the way for Jesus to come. You you have the the destruction of, of Israel by Nebuchadnezzar, and then you have the return, and Israel is never free. They're always occupied by somebody, with the exception of a short period of time when the Maccabean revolt happens. They're they're under control of of Alexander the Great, and then the four nations that come out of him that Daniel prophesied about, primarily the, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And they, they fight, they go back and forth. Um, they go back and forth over, uh, over um, who owns Israel during that time. 
but basically Israel is, is occupied by, by the Macedonians or the Greeks. And then Rome takes over all of Alexander the Great's uh, area, and Rome ultimately destroys Israel. But in the intervening time, what, what happens when Alexander the Great marches all the way to India and conquers most of uh, the Mediterranean area? We get a common trade language and we get trade systems that are, are, very, are very focused on, on interdependence on other peoples. And then Rome comes over and take over, takes over. What happens? What does Rome do? We get good roads, we get good roads and Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Rome brings relative peace from India to Europe. So the entire Mediterranean, greater Mediterranean area, um, Rome brings peace. And it's into that world that Jesus is born that prepares for, for him to be executed and for the gospel to be spread. Think about how hard it would have been. I mean, it was pretty hard. By our standard, it was, it was extremely hard. But think about how much harder it would have been without the peace of Rome and without the Roman roads to spread the gospel. Paul would not have been near as successful in getting around and planting churches like he was. The rest of the apostles wouldn't have gone to India, wouldn't have gone to around Europe and, and down into Africa and so forth, had it not been for the peace of Rome and the, the, uh, the roads of Rome. And so... All of that is set up by God during the intertestamental period. Um, we also have a fundamental transformation of Israel as they come out of exile. It was interesting, one comment that he made today concerning Ezra, that he was hyper-focused on the law. That becomes the theme of what Israel becomes by the time Jesus is there. The Pharisees are the primary political group and they are hyper-focused on the law and so focused on the law that they forget to relate to the lawgiver. And so we have that environment that Jesus is born into. Um, and you can see on the pages of, of history, God orchestrating all of those events so that it's the perfect situation for the, uh, the Messiah to come. So I th I, I'm fascinated by, by the history of uh, the intertestamental period. And by the fact that Daniel predicted the nations, bef you know, 70 years before they, they came. That's, to me, that's all fascinating. The questions or comments? Okay, then we can take a longer break today before the message. Father, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for loving us. We love you and... We want to serve you and we want to be obedient to you. Thank you for men like Greg Kokel and the, their teaching and that we can partake in that and get, a, get an idea how to, uh, to view your word. Thank you for his statement that we need to read scripture in light of, it, of the storyline. In other words, we need to read it in context. It's always context. We can't take it out of context. We need to understand what the writer's meant and what the readers would understand the initial readers would understand so that we can properly understand the principles in it thank you for all that you do for us thank you for loving us in jesus name amen thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from friendship grace brethren church please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you please also consider joining us in person at friendship grace brethren church Located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.